You are listening to the Mary Jane Society podcast, where you will meet entrepreneurs, cultivators, inventors, creators, and leaders in the cannabis industry. I'm your host, Pam Schmiel, marketer and publicist in the cannabis industry. Today we meet Haley and Lana, the ladies behind the cannabis lifestyle brand and design company, Sackville and Co. They both have years of experience in luxury product design and brand development. They stepped into the cannabis industry by introducing a line of accessories that speaks to the Gen Z and millennials. And they have forged partnerships with the likes of Sunday School and Playboy to create cannabis branded accessories. We talk about their approach to branding a whole new industry. We talk about the different consumer archetypes in cannabis and the opportunities to reach them through branding. Let's meet Haley and Lana. Hi, so nice to meet you both, really. I've been kind of looking forward to this conversation. So I've been thinking about wanting to dive into like, you know, designing luxury brands for a long time, but for some reason, I haven't really even met anyone or even, you know, cannabis brand designers. So I think we could just jump into, if you could just give us an overview of Sackville, is it, was it started as a cannabis design company, how you guys met and how you got into cannabis, you know, the usual. (laughs) We started Sackville and Co. in 2018. And this was really, obviously things were changing at that time. Canada was just legalizing. We had a lot of conversations happening kind of about what cannabis legalization would look like in North America. And Lana and I both saw such a clear gap in the market for a brand in the cannabis space that really focused on this consumer who you know, loved, um, loved cannabis, but did not in any way feel uh, akin to the products that were on the market. So if you think back to that time, it was, you know, head shops with big bongs, the grinder that everyone can imagine with, you know, weed leaves all over it. Everything was very geared towards a certain uh, market, which usually targeted a more um, young male skewing audience who felt really comfortable being outward about, you know, cannabis consumption and in this like stoner guy kind of way. And we wanted to create products that we would want to have in our home, that we would want to put on our coffee sh- coffee table or on our shelf and could live their own lives when they weren't in use, as well as when they were in use. They could be conversation pieces and a way to really reimagine your relationship with cannabis instead of it having this kind of like dirty, like, you smoke a joint now, hide everything under the couch or put it into a box or something like that. So we came to that idea and realized we really had the skill set between the two of us to accomplish it. My background is in uh, product design and fashion and Lana's was in brand development, branding and marketing. And so we decided just to kind of put our heads together and come up with what this new vision of cannabis could be in a legalized market. Yeah, there's a, you know, there's a lot of untapped consumer segments and I, see it in my own age, I'm older. And, you know, I always think that, you know, it hasn't appeared yet a lot of things, uh, you know, how I would like to see it, or, you know, that would easily, uh, you know, transition into my lifestyle. So there's a lot of room out there, but you guys are tapping into kind of the luxury, maybe female focused kind of, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we call ourselves attainable luxury. So all of our price points are kind of in that space where, um, you know, you're not like losing a limb to get the grinder. It's still something that very much, you know, we really love the idea, even for ourselves, like that it's not um, a sacrifice. Luxury isn't a sacrifice. It's something that you can still experience. It can transport you, you know, you can set up that your bath and your grinder and all of the things to feel this really luxurious experience. And it's still something you're investing in. So it still has that sustainability thing. Like we're creating pieces that you should have for a very long time, like luxury, you know, obviously luxury items. The reason we invest in them is because you're going to have that piece for a very, very long time. And so we think of it the same way, but in a sense that 
you should be able to um, access it without really like hurting your your purse. Your <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, I like I like that uh, attainable luxury because usually you think of luxury as unaffordable, you know, mm-hmm. high cost and all that kind of stuff. So, um, mm-hmm. okay, so that's kind of focusing me too, which is really great. It's attainable luxury. You can feel like you are living that experience, but not, uh, and I, when I was looking through your website, this just stuck out to me and I just wanted to ask you about this. What's the influencer gift, uh, design that you do? Yeah. Yeah. So go for it. we have to delineate just one more. So Sackville and co, which Haley mentioned was started in 2018. That's our retail brand. So that's the brand that you see that we're designing the products and doing the brand collaborations with, and, you know, all the photo shoots and all that kind of stuff is like, just Haley and I's vision of the world. Like that's just our, what we think is fun and interesting and all that kind of stuff. And then Sackville Studios is our private label um, design and production studio. So the influencer kits is something that we offer through our private label studio, Sackville Studios. So that's something that we work with clients, like many different, you know, we work with large MSOs, retail, um, direct consumer retail brands, cannabis brands outside of cannabis as well, just brands you know and love. Um, and that's kind of the retail gifting, which um, I'm sure Haley, you were going to say something on, but it's basically considerate, thoughtful um, products that we design and develop that are meant to be a little bit more um, like when we're thinking influencer gifting, that's a shrunken scope of an audience that's getting a product or a set or something. Um, but we just consider it with maybe a different lens than it has done before, I think, in this whole environment of like nobody wants to see influencers get just immense amounts of products while the bill is passed on to consumers who are paying for these things you know like it's ultimately something that we try and make not only considered through a consumer's lens of the people who at the end of the day are influenced by these people, but also, um, you know, a sustainability opportunity and an opportunity to really create something like unique with utility and design. And it's just like a very thoughtful and interesting process, which we do without having to impact budget. Like that's all just um, a misnomer. I think in a lot of these um, merchandise swag categories that people think that the that if it's sustainable or if it's unique or thoughtful or something that it has to be more expensive but it's just um it's just a misconception so it's something that we love to work with with clients so you mean so they so I, if I was a client I could come and say I, I I'm going to hire an influencer and and is it the same as is, is it more upscale than those companies where they put your logo on like water bottles but this is going to be more thoughtful more like yeah. cannabis is it kind of along those lines yeah so what we always like to um we like to say to our customers I guess is that you know influencers and consumers alike when you're giving them product you're giving them swag if you want to call it that or these touch points to get to know your brand it's so important that the products that you're giving them actually represent what you believe your brand to be so if you want to Um, tell the story of this outdoorsy cannabis consumer who is using your product and they're going on hikes and that's kind of what your um, consumable product line is built towards if you just give them like a cap and a bag that's going to fall apart in 10 minutes their experience with your brand as a as a, a holistic view is really um, deteriorates because they see it as being this cheap throwaway good. And that automatically in your brain associates to your consumption product as well, that it doesn't have the same um, experience. Yeah. Experience your level. Whereas if you put together a really considerate, thoughtful set of goods that someone wants to use. They want to use over and over again. Maybe they're going on their hike and they have a nice water bottle bag and their water bottle and your products fit perfectly into that bag and they can use it multiple times. And it's this oh, reinforcing no, idea that like, this is a long state product. This is a brand that I want to associate myself with. This is something that integrates into my life. And that makes 
their experience with your brand so much stronger and their likelihood of uh, becoming a super fan of your brand much more, much more likely. And is that, um, is in, are all the gift designs uh, cannabis user or, or cannabis focused? Meaning, so it, it could be like a, a satchel bag, you're going hiking, but you can put a place for your joint or you can put a, you know, like we do everything. <laughs> like we really oh, Okay. Do okay. No, it's, I think it's very, it's, yeah, you yeah. Really have heard of it. It's, it's a, and because it makes like, complete sense. Yeah. Some, some clients come to us and they're like, you know, this, chocolate bar this edible chocolate bar is really geared towards um women of this age and we imagine them watching movies with their friends or x y and z and so what we do is we really create a um an experience around that so maybe it's a robe maybe it's a candle it doesn't necessarily have to be something that fits directly oh, yeah. into the canvas product but it's creating that experience which then connects them to your brand and what you're trying to um, the stories that you're trying to tell through your brand on a deeper level. I see. So like what Lana was saying, like more, more, uh, more thoughtful and more focused on. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That that's great. Great idea. <laughs> so um, how did you guys, how did you break into cannabis? Like what was your first, maybe you don't even have to tell me like what, you know, company hired you or whatever, but how, what, how did that start? Did you, and then did it just keep rolling after that? We didn't, we just did it. We just broke in with our own fists. We had our own, we never worked in cannabis before. And then we just decided we were going to do it. And we started Sackville. We launched with one, that's Sackville & Co., the consumer-facing oh. brand. We launched with our signature grinder, the gold signature grinder, and um, papers and cones. So we launched with a really, really limited SKU set. We made a little bit of money off that, continued to reinvest into the business. And then um, in 2020 is when we launched Sackville Studio. So we just kept reinvesting and growing the kind of ecosystem of um, Sackville, which has become quite, quite large. But it, yeah, we just, the, we really had no business other than understanding that there was a huge um, kind of gap that we saw that no one was catering to, like Haley said, and we just felt like we were the audience and no one was designing anything or speaking to us or marketing to us. And we wanted to create products that we thought would fit our lifestyle. And it obviously turns out that there's tons of people like us who also want products that in the same kind of way. So, yeah, and Studios was very organic. Like so many people saw what we had created with Sackville and Co. the brand, and then naturally reached out to us and asked, like, "Hey, can you do something like that for me?" Um, right, right. And again, that's a huge variation of of companies we would get outreach from. So it was a clear gap where no one was really providing this service to those companies. So that's how Studios really came to be. Okay. And are you working with clients or have you worked with clients all over the country? Are you kind of focused in one area? Are you in one state? How's... We're definitely global. So we sell with Sackville & Co. We sell all over the world. Um, and Sackville Studios, we've worked, like we started, we work with global companies. We started with um, Playboy actually. So that was where we kind of, we had a couple small clients that were based in the US and obviously Playboy is based here, but a massive global brand. So we designed um, a private label collection for them that they launched um, globally. And we've worked with brands all over the world, UK, in- yeah. We're getting like so much everywhere. more outreach now from like uh, Europe and the UK yes. and yes. places that are opening up. So it's interesting to see because it's, you know, it's the same need everywhere. Yeah, yeah, and ultimately, I think you know we're not the the audience that we're working with is we are working with dispensaries, we do work with cannabis brands, but we're also working with brands that are looking and understanding that this is the start of a massive change in social culture and so they're looking to speak to their consumer in a new way so they're actually creating products that that they'll never ever get into cannabis maybe they're a fashion brand they're a music artist they're whatever that may be um, and they're looking to just create products that continue to signal and nod to a can of conscious consumer it's another language the same way that 
Alcohol is something that we all accept as a part of our social fabric and we create spaces for entertainment that and language and all of that that communicate how we use alcohol to socially participate. And I think brands are doing the exact same thing with cannabis where they're creating products that the same way as like you may just create like a you know, even if it's shirts with insignia that have the same kind of stuff with alcohol or like a cute wine glass or something as your merch piece, they're creating items that can kind of just speak to that audience. So the our audience with Sackville Studios is way more broad than the actual cannabis industry itself, which is really, really cool because we obviously get to flex our design muscle a lot because the use cases are very, very different depending on if it's a dispensary, like a hyper-local dispensary that's wanting to create a very specific category for an audience that's, you know, local and they know exactly who it is, or a brand that's been around for 30 years and is wanting to now speak to a completely new generation that doesn't have the same kind of connotations with cannabis and is, is um, you know, just entering a new phase of their adulthood or whatever that looks like so I could see a brand coming to you or a new brand coming to you and wanting you know a to z um brand um design and all that but so for a dispensary when they come to you is it just basically for logo design kind of a look and feel for their whole logo um we do those projects we typically do we still typically sit within within um products so lots of brands under are building out their inline categories oh. so they'll yeah, so they're looking for accessories and all that stuff as well. So we still don't do plant touching products, but the same kinds of things. And I think especially as the retail sphere is really changing. I mean, I think obviously we'll touch on this later, but New York is such a good example of how people are coming to the market in physical retail in a much more thoughtful way that translates automatically into the products that they want their their um their logo on. So they don't want to be seen the same as your traditional head shop. They want to be seen in this elevated light. And so the products that they have on their shelf that are home branded, they want to give off that same experience. Right. So I, right. I forgot. So there are a lot of dispensaries, not in every state, but that can do it, but are that are creating their own in-house brands. I mean, oh, New York right. can't do it, but um, yeah. Right. So I guess a dispensary could come to you logo and then their in-house brand design too. Even if they just want like a t-shirt or a tote bag or whatever it is that's sold in their store, they want it to feel elevated. They like, I think a huge thing with cannabis is breaking that stigma of it being something that has to be hidden or not talked about. So when you're creating goods that are going to be a scene, um, like a tote bag, which is kind of like your like, you know, billboard product. You yeah. want it to feel like it's quality, like it's something people look at and they think is like a really exciting product. And so that's where people come to us where they want something that's more thoughtful. So yeah. So before we get into New York, which I thought that would be kind of like a fun uh, you know, example to look at for your expertise and get your ideas. But um, and are you're based in New York, right? Both of you? Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. Um, so maybe we should just jump to New York then and we'll just talk about how you guys would approach it. Um, you know, the New York market, especially since you know it really well. And it's, you know, it's in, in this whole area up here, this whole tri-state area is one of the most populated in the country, supposedly. And it's going to be such a big market if we can ever get out there. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I, I guess what I would say, I, maybe if we looked at it, like if I was a client trying to launch a brand in New in New York State, um, like what what when you sit down with a client first and, and you're thinking, okay, she wants to launch in New York, and I do want to be you know kind of luxury focused or a little bit more high end, and and thinking about all the people here because we have a lot of tourists, we have such diversity. Uh, like what is what is your what is your routine when you sit down with a client and and also thinking about the New York uh the New York consumer and then all the tourists we have here too. So if you were yeah. if you were consulting with me, I guess what what is the first thing you would start asking me and breaking down? How do you approach that? And I mean, if it was you and this was a conversation, it sounds like you're at day one of trying to figure out how to get 
how to get in and where to go. Um, Typically we're, you know, ultimately the industry, we all still have to remember that there's a lot of space still in the cannabis industry. There's a lot of brands to be developed. There's a lot of you know, markets to be captured. There's still like, if you think of any industry, we are nowhere near where, you know, market saturation, you know, beauty is a brand, is an industry that I think is a really great example that has innumerable of the exact same products on the market realistically. And you're just differentiating your audience, your story, your branding, your, you know, obviously there's, there's value propositions and there's ingredients propositions and all the kind of same things that cannabis will be doing. There'll be luxury ingredients and there will be value buys and things like that. But it's really, I think about finding your own niche. Like what are you, what is your story? What is your purpose? What is your everything? Like we we really think that it's the best approach to find something that's authentic to something that you can drive forward. So if you have a story, if you have the ability to kind of authentically create something with that longevity, that's the best way to go. So obviously um, demographic wise and what you're able to, like the things that you're interested in. um, I think that we've all kind of heard the, the stories of, the attempt, like if you're trying to be something for everyone, you'll be nothing for no one kind of concept. So you really do need to be willing to alienate an audience, alienate people that is, you know, be something very specific. And some people are not going to like it on either side. And that's like a, a challenge of an entrepreneur. And I think a challenge of marketing anything or creating a brand for anything is recognizing that you do have to actually be, um, I want to say quite rigid with your vision, even while you're in the early stages, while you're acknowledging people kind of come in and out and say like, you should change it this way, or you should open it up this way, or people that are, you know, 10 years older, aren't going to like this, or 10 years younger, aren't going to like this, or whatever it is, because ultimately, the closer you are to that kind of vision and narrative, then the more people you're going to attract as you grow with your audience, the more specific you are. So I think that that's like the, where we start is just really diving into like, who do you think you are and where do you want to be? And then we distill that into the pieces of brand product. Are you display, if you're already a brand that exists, are you displaying who you think you are? Cause lots of times brands will say, something that they think they are and their brand is really not giving that across, whether it's in the colorways, the tone of the language, the products they're putting out, all those kinds of things. Like we definitely have clients who, you know, want to maybe be luxury, but are putting products out that are, you know, not in the same category or different places. And we can kind of help, help direct those, those um, narratives. But that's, I think the main thing is we just help question something to distill down what the actual truth of it all is, as opposed to getting a lot of feedback and trying to answer all the questions all at once and make an imaginary scenario happen, which just is not a a productive nor a sustainable model, I think, for a business. Like as designers go, okay, we're looking at the New York market. You're going to look at all those brands. How do you differentiate? Like what goes in your mind, like what goes through your mind when you try to think about like, how do we differentiate? Then what's your process of going at your design process? I think like when I was speaking to at the beginning there, it's a recognition that there really are so many different diverse cannabis consumers who just have not been targeted to at all. Mm -hmm. And I think what, you know, we see this, we, we especially have seen this, um, when we talk about, um, female brands and flower, because, you get a lot of dispensaries who will be like, you know, we have shelf space for one female brand because that's how it works here. And then the rest of their shelf space is for like all like Grateful Dead inspired (laughs) cannabis brands. And you're like, okay, well, this seems like there's a lot for one demographic and not for anybody else. And there really are so many different ways that you could approach a cannabis consumer and really show up 
uh, and communicate that you see their needs. So whether that is a demographic basis, you know, if you're going for like a Gen Z consumer, a younger consumer, or an older consumer, like really thoughtful thinking about what their consumption experience is like, what it's been like in the past, what they're looking for in the legal market. Um, there's so many different ways you can approach it to make sure that you're reaching an audience who, again, is already there. Like people are already using cannabis. They're just not being seen in the brands that are being put out there. So it's just reaching across, you know, and saying like, hey, we see you, we see what you're looking for, what you'd want, what would make this a more enjoyable experience for you. And we're ensuring that we're providing it with our products. I actually interviewed someone, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, and he's an expert on uh, sensory science. And he actually created a, a cannabis aroma lexicon. He and his company have started, they're based out of Michigan. So they're working through this. This is like his expertise. He has a PhD in it and all that. But he, he was talking about how someone could use uh, all the different aromas, like kind of like they do in perfume, I guess that's what attracts people to perfume. Yeah. But he goes, there's so like, as they're building out this lexicon, there's so it's so deep about, you know, all the the smells and that you could use to kind of differentiate the aromas to differentiate your product to try to stand out there. He thought in the luxury market, you know, um, so we're definitely seeing more of that with like terpenes and terpene misted products and things like that. And I think that um, it just comes to like, you know, uh, I think the category itself maturing and growing. I think a lot of people see cannabis um, in a very one sided view because it was a, a you know it was a, a legal market you're buying product illicitly you're not getting a readout on any of the information on that product so you have no concept of how to gauge it of like is this a high THC or a low THC or does this have other cannabinoids in it or you know there's none of that was part of the conversation about cannabis pre-legalization and so I think everybody who is a cannabis consumer is learning a new um, relationship with it because yeah. you start to learn like, oh, I really like this terpene in my cannabis, or I really like, you know, this, this cannabinoid mix like really works with me. And that is going to be something that just happens with the maturity of the market. I think when people get to actually experience different products where it's not just based on like how high can you get the THC it's actually based on a bunch of other things um that's a really exciting place to play in for sure yeah yeah um okay so uh I'll start winding it down because I know we're getting on here but if you guys were to create a brand that would be plant touching like a brand in the marketplace that could be your own what uh segment would you go after like which uh consumer group would you go after the gen c to go after like what as far as in New York State where do you think the you know the um because Sackle and Co is very much our baby right. it's yeah. yeah our brand that we're attacking the market and uh, the world with we it's still very much so it's like Gen Z millennial um it skews very much Gen Z it's kind of shocking because the Gen Z market is still so few of them are kind of of that legal age to consume cannabis but they're already really dominating um you know from communication and interest and marketing and buying power and all that stuff in the industry and they've we love them and they've taken a liking to our brand and we're obsessed and it's been super fun so that's who and obviously millennials were millennials. We speak <laughs> millennial. So we, that's kind of who we're, we're after. And it's something that, you know, Sackville itself will continue to grow um, both in, in product and product categories and everything. So Sackville and co is something definitely that will be expanding um, in statewide and product depth. So Oh, I so I, oh okay, All right. So we could look at your website and see that and understand that that's that that's what's appealing to that's what you would think is appealing to the Gen Z and the millennial group, right? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I guess, but another question I've been wondering about uh, from the design perspective in the cannabis industry is, you know, now that we're all in these state silos. 
like you're used to designing national global level, like when you're probably thinking about your product development and design, are, I guess, are you, you're still doing that? Or do you see anything that people that entrepreneurs have to think about differently in the situation that we're in when we're trying to kind of grow and, you know, organically build within our state and then be ready for cross border. And then of course, global. And then and one more thing I just want to add to that is, you know, I feel like in New York, city especially we're really you a brand is very uniquely positioned to be able to launch globally because of all the the international tourists that we have that you're already building your brand awareness in this marketplace and the dispensaries that they would be coming so i feel like that's a consideration too so i'm just is is there a difference in how you're approaching this when well, I'll speak on that um <laughs> yeah i think that it's crazy town to not consider the larger global market. Like there's pizza places that create massively successful e-commerce channels for merchandise and, you know, ultimately building cult followings and branding opportunities. Like there's no reason to consider yourself outside of those kinds of opportunities because you're hyper-localized, like just because you may have one brick and mortar in your hometown or whatever that looks like um obviously everyone there's different goals with different businesses not everybody wants to build you know a massive eating breathing beast that needs to kind of like be fed all the time I think that there's things that can be in between that but there's there's huge opportunity to be able to engage even just using social media even just creating opportunity like with Instagram shop and you know creating you don't have to be doing things in mass amounts you can be creating things that your consumers want that although they can't get it in because they can't access your state or something that maybe there's a there's a version of that that can cross state borders that your consumers will love that I think you know those kinds of opportunities are always valuable so we definitely always picture everything to be the future state we never we never really play small um or consider this to be like this this blip in time right now where everything is hyper segregated we don't really consider that because I think if you do you ultimately just end up putting yourself a little bit behind in the future so right Sorry, because sirens. New York yeah. I don't know if you know the sirens well, also no I didn't okay. but um <laughs> I was gonna say like you look at any other industry and New York really is a birthplace of global brands and I don't think it will be any different for cannabis you know you have like you were saying it's a massive um, opportunity where tourists come in and they get to see these brands and go home and talk about these brands, take home their nostalgic, you know, pieces of whatever from these brands and their big apple grinder. Their big <laughs> apple grinder, exactly. <laughs> and any of that, it starts to create a global community and a global interest. And like Lana was saying, like you have people who come to New York and they know exactly what pizza shops they're going to. They know exactly what fashion stores they're going to because they see it and they live it online. And we live in such a digital world where we all are so connected that you know, we expect that the cannabis brands coming out of New York are really going to shape that conversation globally. Yeah, I, I I would be really excited if I was a designer or brand in New York City, really, because I think that's such a great opportunity. Um, um, and then uh, with, um, you know, it seems like there's been a lot of, uh, not a lot of talk, but it seems like, you know, a lot of celebrities started coming in and, you know, uh, you know, partnering with brands and different things like that, but it doesn't seem to be doing as well, or it doesn't seem to be uh, moving the needle as much as it does in other industries for some strange reason. Uh, and I see that you've, I think, partnered with some artists, musicians, and and are you finding the same thing or are you kind of, you do your design and then they're gone and you're not really sure what how that plays out, what the rate, rate of return is on that? I think it really depends on how like um, authentic and organic it is. For us, we've done collaborations with a few celebrities or, or artists. So like an example would be like Flatbush Zombies or Jizza from Wu-Tang. And those did really well because they were such an organic extension of the artist. You know, this was a set that made 
made sense for going to your concert and you have all your goods or going um, on the road and it 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 fed into the story that naturally evolved from what they already do. So it made sense to their audience to continue that way. I think a lot of the times when you just pair a celebrity to a product, um, especially a product in the cannabis industry, which again is difficult, it's just a difficult industry uh, for multitudes of different reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not as easy as maybe if you, you know, paired them with a, alcohol brand or something like that we're, we're still in that phase where there's a lot of regulation and restriction so it's difficult to to move the needle on hmm. yeah it's, you just don't hear a lot of good good you know response I feel like they're kind of people aren't going for that as much anymore you haven't heard about as much anymore and then I guess we can end it with um what do you view the state of cannabis industry for brands in the future or maybe just in New York State how do you you know see and then what's 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 next for Sackville just there's a million changes that need to continue to happen. So I think for brands, it's really, it's like a very, you know, we all are waiting with bated breath kind of thing. It's, it's a bit of a, I would say like heightened anxiety time because everyone is a little bit tied with their hands behind their back because we just don't have the same tools that, that companies use to build a brand. Um, And then of course, that is difficult because you also in the cannabis industry in an industry that isn't federally legal, you don't have the same access to the financial tools that companies use to build companies as well. So it's, um, I think that we're just all eagerly awaiting this kind of like, yeah, let's let's make this a real industry kind of thing um and we of course we're um we have we're bootstrapped we are self-funded and we have built this um all ourselves so it's something that we're very very hyper focused on because a lot of companies do have a little bit of room for error because they have a lot of investment or they have a lot of you know debt financing or these different things but we're a company that runs completely off of our profitability. So we have to be very, very aware of what's happening in the world and how that's moving and how that impacts us. And um, because we obviously don't have that kind of same room for error. So yeah, for brands, I think that there's little things that are changing. Like, I mean, so it seems to be loosening up in the marketing world, mind you, marketing, like the whole last new social platform just happened like nobody knows what's happening in marketing I know I know oh my god it's so but yeah I think that everyone is still you know excited I think New York is is um is has been like a an interesting last two years obviously but the in light of these new kind of legal openings and some of the stores here are just so stunning and they're really changing the game I think in what retail looks like and how that can feel and it's starting to bubble up what I think everyone's been waiting for that sense of like yeah New York is going to be leading the way in branding in developing new concepts and new concept stores and the new way that people kind of interact with this industry so that's like definitely in the last six months or so started to feel like something so I think that it's like hopeful right now for sure. Yeah, I'm feeling just a teeny bit of, I mean, even though there hasn't been any movement in the government, but I don't know, I feel like there's some movement, I don't know what it is, but I feel like at least, I don't feel like we're fading, I know, fingers crossed. Um, Yeah. I mean, you guys seem like you're off to a great start anyway, I mean, what the future could be, you just keep going, I guess, and it sounds like you're, right? Yeah. Yeah. And what, what, if you had a dream client job, somebody come to you, is it just everything that you love to do? Or is there something that you just really love to do? Like, as far as you want to sink your teeth into a project? I was like, our dream client would be designing a cannabis brand for Rihanna, but yeah. um, <laughs> we just have to shout it out every time. Yeah. Yeah. Please, um, please, universe. That's great. But oh generally, God. like, we, we, love, we love working with all clients because it is so interesting to get into the depth of storytelling of what is their product? how are they how are they um communicating with the audience like how is their product different what is it what is it providing i mean there's so much that um again like we were saying that just hasn't been launched in cannabis yet and so at the forefront of really being able to see these new um stories take 
uh, come together, it's, it's, that's really fun. Wow. Well, ladies, thank you so much for joining me. This was really great. It was really nice to meet you. Well, anyway, take care and I really do hope we get